Um, do you identify as black? <laughs> no, it's a serious question, because you might not identify. Can you please put the mic? Thank you. Okay. Uh, when I walked Less into the, when I walked into the room, when I walked into the room. I'm not done with my question. Oh, 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 oh gonna, young lady, well, just, young lady. I'm just asking you to listen to me. And, and, I, and I'm about to answer your first question. I didn't, I didn't finish my question. Okay. Yeah, I'm black. When our law enforcement officers um, arrest African Americans, uh, African Americans are five times more likely to be arrested than um, white Americans. Isn't that an inequality of opportunity for these people typically living in inner city neighborhoods? I grew up in the inner city. I could have fallen and gone down the wrong path. And if I go down the wrong path and I'm responsible for those actions and their consequences just to those actions. And I would just say to the young black men and women in the inner cities, don't go to the gangs. Don't go down the path of lawlessness. Go down the path of thinking about your future. But when you talk about like the institutional reality that African Americans are arrested five times, they're five times more likely to be arrested than white people, isn't there something institutional, not just a choice? Because then we wouldn't have that, that, that disparity. Like, where does the disparity come from? I, I do not agree with police harassing anybody. And they're just the same as they're bad soldiers, they're bad cops. And bad cops need to be prosecuted, just like what we saw in South Carolina. But I think inherently we have a problem with criminality in our inner city communities. And the real problem, we're, we're just talking about a symptom. The real disease in the inner city communities is the fact that when I was born in 1961, a two-parent household in the black community was between 75 and 77 percent. Today, it's only 24 percent. Well, actually, I will tell you, it's even deeper than that. You can read about the Great Society programs of Lyndon Baines Johnson, 1965, when he came up with a policy that said if a woman has a child out of wedlock, the government will provide her a check, no matter how many children she has out of wedlock. But there was a caveat, she cannot have a man in the home. You destroyed the black community with that simple policy. But I am really concerned about what's happening on college campuses and universities. I mean, you can go back and see what happened when I spoke at St. Louis. University. That was pretty. That was that was a blast. That was funny, man. I laughed my butt off about that. These kids thought that, hey, we're gonna get up and walk out before he speaks. Like that's really gonna hurt my feelings. Okay, I've been shot at. I used to jump out of airplanes, man. Come on, bring it. Okay, <laughs> but but the thing is this: they got up and walked out instead of sitting there and having a challenging conversation parents. we got to do better for our kids. There's some parents paying a lot of big jack to send their kids here. What kind of real education they're getting? Because then they're going to go out to the real world and they're going to collapse. Like I said, there are no binkies, there's no hot cocoa, there's no puppy dog, there's no safe space out in the real world. Okay? You got to get it on. You got to do it. Do you not think the rhetoric of defining ISIS as Islamic is in itself problematic in a nation where xenophobia is resulting in material violence against Muslim Americans, specifically when ISIS is taking Islamic religious documents out of context? When you're standing over young girls and you're about to rape them and you're reading from a Quran, don't get mad at me. That's what they're doing. Hey, you can say what you want, brother. That's what they're doing. I don't know. Ask them before they do it. I'm, I'm, I'm over here in America. I'm not doing that. But what I'm saying is that why do we continue to say, let's not believe what they're saying. Why do, we, why do we continue to want to say, let's deny history. Let's deny all these things that have happened because we don't want to upset this greater, uh, you know, entity. I have gone over to these countries. I have fought for their freedom. I understand that. And I understand that there is also a contingent that is following a phase of Islam, if you understand the first phase from 610 to 622 AD, from 622 to 628, in those six year period, Muhammad led 33 combat raids. The first one started was the Nakla raid. They are following his tradition. They are following his precepts. When he came back to Mecca, he ordered the beheading of 700 people there in Mecca. I didn't do that. And the thing is that everyone continues to come here and say, don't say that because you upset and offend other people. Well, I want them to be upset. I want them to be offended. So maybe they can join us in this fight so that nine people in a 
mall in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Don't get asked if they're Muslim or not and they get stabbed. I don't want that happening in the United States of America. I don't want that happening anywhere. I don't want it happen in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And I've been willing to put my life on the line for that. I don't know if you have, but I have. The KKK and white nationalists are threats to black individuals at, uh, in the United States. There have been multiple shootings recently within the last 10 years, and there have been an increase of violence against black people. And I wanted to know if you think that that's a national security issue and how you would address that. Yeah, I think it's a national security issue right here in the south side of Chicago where you have a combat zone going on and Rahm Emanuel and everyone just seems to not care or as well as in Baltimore or other places. And that's black on black crime. That's not KKK or whatever. What about but, white on black crime? I'm well, sorry, but that's, that's what I was asking. Oh, okay, well then, have you ever heard of Margaret Sanger? Well, Mar Margaret Sanger and the organization that she founded uh, since 1973, almost 17 million unborn black babies have been murdered by that organization. I think that's something that we should really be concerned about. The fact that the United States government gives $568.7 million to an organization that was founded by a white supremacist, a racist, a person that uh, spoke at Klan rallies, that referred to blacks as undesirables and weeds, I would join forces with you in a heartbeat to say that we need to cut off funding to an organization like that called Planned Parenthood. That 50, well, I don't think we give taxpayer money to the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I've, 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 well, yeah, they have. The, white, the FBI goes after white supremacist organizations. But then I would ask you, why is it that, why is it that nobody goes after Antifa? I mean, I think Antifa is also a domestic terrorist organization. I mean, look at what they have done at uh, certain colleges and universities to prevent people from going out there and uh, freely speaking. So uh, let's, let's, call, let's call a ball a ball and a strike a strike. And so there are many organizations out there that we need to be targeting. But I will tell you, first and foremost, we shouldn't give $568.7 million to an organization like that. And if you do some research, I think between 50 to 55 percent of Planned Parenthood clinics are in black communities. That's a travesty. Less than 9% of the people in this room are black, and we're all not here for you. Do okay. you think there are racial inequalities in America, and how do you feel about Trump increasing both economic inequality and discrimination for people, people of color and LGBTQ people? What about violence against marginalized people in the United States? Can you talk about that? Well, the, the subject was about, you know, national security and foreign policy. But I will tell you that uh, I think in the minority community, in the black community, I think they're pretty happy that unemployment isn't at an all-time low in the United States of America for Hispanic and black communities. And, and that's the truth. As a matter of fact, overall unemployment is an all-time low. So if you want to break the, uh, the pay gap or racial inequality gap, the most important thing is my parents taught me, who were black, born and raised down south, was about equality of opportunity and not equality of outcome. And so, you know, you talk about this and, and you kind of trace this history that we have against Islamism or Islamists. And, and, you know, you talk about, you almost paint this us versus them mentality. You know, when you talk about your... No, they painted but, 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 us versus but, but, No, mentality. but, you know, when you talk about, like, you, you talked about Fort Hood and, and the personal touch that you had there. But, you know, when we talk about Al-Shabaab and, and, like, the Kenyan Westgate mall shooting, you know, I was there the year before that. When we talk about the Taliban in Pakistan, you know, those are people of my community that are being targeted. Okay, and so, so why don't you join no, no, me in this fight? Right, and, and so no, I am. No, and no, no, and, and, you know, fight. you've left out, what well, you've left out, no, you know, I'm like at Gonzaga. Why don't you join me in this and, fight? We have, but that's my point. We have, right? When you look at, How? when you look at members, because How? when you look at members of the Islamic community, when you right. look at these open letters that people have written denouncing these fights, and when you look at people in the Islamic world, in the Middle East, who have joined these fights with the United States, in cooperation with the United States, right? And you look at what they retrieve, what they receive in, 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 in response to that, right? You look at the Iraqi policemen that, that participated in the fight against Islamic radi radicalism, well, look, I, whatever I, you want to call I, it. I they get detained the soldiers at in Iraq and But my point is, where, where is the value in demonizing the entire group of people if you're looking for their oh, help Oh, time return? out, Slick. Right, but well, time out. you did not hear me demonize an entire no, group of people. But you're tracing, but you're tracing this you entire history as You did not hear me demonize you, an entire group continue, of people. Sorry, continue. You did not hear me demonize an entire group of people. I was very specific when I said, I said Islamism, Islamists. I never said Muslims, okay? 
there is an ideology out there that we need to deal with. Now, if you want me to go into a historical exegesis of Islamism, I can start at 622 after the Hijra and how the verses in the Quran did change, I mean, from the previous peaceful verses from 610 to 622. Now, but there's, no, I'm not choosing anything. Well, you leave out a picture that I've seen you talk about, you know, when you reference I'm not. Dude, why why do I need to sit here and talk you. about? Hold on, hold on. Okay, you, you want you want me to you want me to make you feel good. No, that's not. Now, what that's what you want. No, you sir, want me to come up here and blow sunshine up everybody's not. butt and make no, them sir. feel good and say no, everything is hunky dory. There's no bad guys say, out there. No, no sir, I'm the not going to do that. Kind of place, I understand that. I'm not going to do that. I understand that as well. I'm not. I'm not going to do that. What good does it do? What good does it do for me to stand up here and talk about? all the great things. We have to come together and talk about that which is out there is bad. Bashar al-Assad is just as bad as anyone, uh, Abdul Bakar al-Baghdadi. I mean, to drop chemical weapons on your own people? I mean, I, I stand against that. So I don't know what you want me to stand up here and say. You want me to obfuscate, deny, and dismiss an evil that exists? I ain't gonna do it. Is, do you really feel that despite the fact that he's in this amazing position, this blessed position, that he really doesn't have a stance to say those things because like yourself- well, of course, you got his First Amendment freedom of speech. There's no doubt about it. What I would say is that there also comes a, a level of responsibility with that position that you take to be able to articulate you know, that issue. I would say to Colin, why don't you go and establish a scholarship for a young black kid coming out of the inner city? Okay, why don't you articulate, you know, your breadth and understanding of the, some of the critical things that are affecting the black community and not just jump on, you know, this, this bandwagon that police are bad, the country is bad, you know, because we need more social justice. And in the piece that I wrote, what I asked him was, define social justice. And that's all I'm saying. You can't go out there, young folks and just throw a word out there, throw a term out there, throw, throw some sound bite, throw some talking point out there. Because you gotta be able to stand up and, and justify and articulate your position. I don't care what side of the political spectrum you're on, but you have to be able to articulate your position. And I think that is the point that I have with Colin Kaepernick. And then the other thing that I, I, I wrote in the piece, I said maybe he should take just a little two, three week hiatus and go to Afghanistan and be on a forward operating base out of the middle of nowhere where that flag flies over it and throw a football with some of those young men that are there every day standing on freedom's ramparts so that he has that First Amendment freedom. Can you show me one verse in this Quran where it says to attack America? Attack Americans or attack innocent people? Well, of course it doesn't say attack America or attack Americans. I mean, the, the book was written back, you know, somewhere around the 8th and 9th century, so America wasn't even around to say attack America. But you do have a verse of the sword that is, is in there, and, and, and there is talk about killing infidels. Look, sure. you know, don't sure. talk about that. We don't have that. We don't have that. This is a losing proposition. From 622 AD. myself as long as possible 
and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death, William Barrett Travis, Lieutenant Colonel, Commandant. That was the letter that was written, given to a young man by the name of Juan Seguin and delivered to Sam Houston. You all know the story about the Alamo. 13 days, 185 men stood there. That's where, when I went to University of Tennessee, we earned our nickname as the Volunteers. But the thing that I want you to understand is that William Barrett Travis, when he wrote that incredible letter, was only 26 years of age. Same age as my daughter is right now, the oldest. I want you to have that exact same character, that exact same spirit, that exact same desire to stand and fight. Because when I look at where you are on these college campuses and university campuses all across the United States of America, it may seem like you are surrounded. It may seem like you have no hope whatsoever. It may seem like a desperate situation, but you've got to make a stand if you truly believe in this constitutional republic. I want you to have the exact same spirit of so many of our forefathers and foremothers. Did they just sit back and wait for their time? They had it within their hearts. They knew what freedom meant. They knew what liberty stood for. And they said, I'll make my own stand. I want you to think about how in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8, when Isaiah stood before the host of the Lord, and they said, whom shall we send? Who will go for us? I want each and every one of you to stand up and say, here am I. Send me. So I have a quote from you here. It says, I think that there, there meaning the Black Lives Matter movement, whole existence is just a liberal progressive socialist movement to make sure that they keep the black community on the 21st century economic plantation that's been created by the left. Would you like to clarify that? I can clarify it very easily. And let me tell you, all lives matter. It's not just about black lives matter, okay? Now. If you really are concerned, start talking about school choice in the black community. If you really are concerned, start talking about the decimation of the black family, which I don't hear. Do not be manipulated by people that are using you as a political tool so that you can keep your own people suppressed. Get off the plantation and think on your own. Have a good night.